Okay. All right, is Zoom on? Okay. If I can get everybody to take their seats. Okay, the first question I have here is the lady that was supposed to give me a ride home didn't show up tonight. So if she doesn't show up tonight, can somebody give me a ride home on that lives on the east side of town? Oh, you can? I'll let you come in and see Rue if you do. Okay, cool. Thank you, Liz. So I want to welcome everybody tonight to our monthly Alaska Society of Outdoor and Nature Photographers meeting. I have a few announcements before we get the show started. We're really excited to have Ken Bear here tonight. But first of all, the one thing that we are still looking for is somebody that would be interested in signing up to help with Alaska Wild. Uh, Jen will be stepping down in 2025, and we need some people to help take her place. She's done an amazing job. She's set things up so beautifully that taking it over won't be that difficult. But instead of just having one person do the job, we thought we would try to get two to three people that might be interested in helping us out. So in the back, Corey, do you have a sign-up sheet? We'll make a sign-up sheet. If anybody's interested, we still have a little bit of time, but just if you'd be willing to help with just even small parts of Alaska Wild, it's the only way we're going to be able to keep it going because it is a big job and we know that we love to see our pictures traveling around the state. So um, also just a reminder, if you haven't paid yet, there's still time. So get your payments in. You can do it online. You can do it with Glenn, you can send me a check, could just make it out to me. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But um, there's lots of things that, that ways that you can, can get paid. So does anybody have any announcements about workshops or anything else? I saw a sign up, Ray, that do you wanna talk anything about your workshop that you're doing? Yeah, I've got a life workspace workshop uh, on the 24th of Saturday, February 24th. If you're struggling with your Lightroom catalog or organizational issues or how to use Lightroom, um, this would be a good workshop for you guys to attend. Okay, for those who are online and might not have heard that, Ray's got a Lightroom workshop on February 24th. Four at APU. Saturday, 9 to 4 at Alaska Pacific University. You can reach Ray at raybolson.com. That's B-U-L-S-O-N for those of you who are online. So without further ado, any more announcements anybody wants to make? Okay. We do have Alaska Wild Books for Sale, which Corey reminds me. Don't forget, we've got lots of them. And we need to sell them. We've got new books coming in any day now for the 2024 show. So, and um, and don't forget next month, we will have several speakers that night. We have the Alaska Wild winners, as well as all of the people that entered. We have a little slideshow to show that. John Cornforth, the Alaska Wild judge will be here to do a little bit of a talk. And also Mike DeYoung is going to do a talk on his trip to Peru and climbing with light gear. And all of those things will probably take more than 6 to 8 p.m. So we're actually going to start the program at 5.30 sharp. And we the doors will be open here at 5 o'clock if you want to do your half hour mingling. Oh, and my ride just got here. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, but if you can try to get here before 5.30, so we can get started right at 5.30. I won't be here, unfortunately, but um, it should be a really packed night of, of good slideshows. So now I get to introduce Ken Bear. Ken Bear and I have been friends for a very long time. I can't even remember how long, 20 years more or more? 2002. 2002, so 22 years or three years. Anyway, I have known Ken for a long time. He started out as a military photographer. We've done many, many workshops together. Um, 
one of my favorite workshops I did with Ken was with Nancy Rotenberg. And I think she sort of drove Ken a little bit into the direction that he's gone with most of his photography these days. And so without further ado, I can hardly wait to hear all about the creative side that Ken has to share with us tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, let me apologize uh, up front. My voice is a little weak. Uh, usually I can out talk Kathy, but not tonight. So if you can, uh, if you can't hear me, please raise your hand, yell, scream something, and I'll try and talk a little louder. Uh, and I hope the people online can hear. I guess it's okay now. Good. And that works, so we're in good shape. We're going to talk about tabletop imagery, but let me give you a little background as to where I came from and how I got there. I enlisted in the Air Force in 1965, and I wanted to be a photographer. And they said, okay, you can be a photographer. And they sent me to Vandenberg Air Force Base. And when I arrived, I, I found out I was not going to be a photographer. I was going to be a lab rat. And a lab rat is somebody who processes motion picture films. And Vandenberg uh, was testing the Agena missile system and the Minuteman III miss missile system at that time. And my job was to do the chemistry and process the motion picture film from 118 cameras on each of those launches. And our squadron had to turn that film in 24 hours. The rule of thumb at that time was that technically the film had to be absolutely perfect in terms of processing in color balance and uh, exposure and all of that kind of stuff because the engineers used that film to determine the success of the engine firing sequence. And I learned from them telling us how important our job was, is that the color of the flame gave them a tremendous amount of information as to how hot the engine was burning. And that would correlate with the sensors. And therefore, we had to process color extremely accurately. And that became a mantra for that squadron. During my time as a lab rat, and I really enjoyed it, and I learned a lot because they sent me down to Technicolor uh, to spend a week with the chief chemist at Technicolor to learn how the chemistry worked and how we could control it. And they sent me to Eastman Kodak to, to work with the engineers at Kodak to learn how film worked and how the pixels worked and how the silver halides worked. And I received a very very good education on the workings of film. About that time, uh, the squadron commander decided that they needed to have some people cross-train from laboratory capabilities to also be cameramen. And I, I have to tell a funny story. I was the low man on the totem pole. I mean, I was an Airman One striper, Airman Third Class. And so I spent a lot of time learning how to operate motion picture chemistry and process motion picture film. But I also spent a lot of time doing corrosion control and mopping floors and cleaning offices and doing stuff like that too. And so one time they assigned me to do corrosion control on the I-beams, 30-foot long I-beams that supported the motion picture processing tanks. And the way you did this is they gave me a can of muriac acid and a respirator and sent me down in the basement on a ladder in 95 degrees, and they gave me a wire toothbrush. Literally a wire toothbrush, the same size as the kind of toothbrush you brush your teeth with, only it was wire. And I had to scrape all the corrosion off with the muric acid off the I-beam so it would continue to support uh, the motion picture processing system. 
in about six hours, I had finished all but the last two feet of that I-beam. And the uh, NCOIC of the section came down and had mercy on me. And he says, Ken, you've worked real hard. You've done a good job. I'll come and get somebody to finish that. And for some crazy reason, I said, no, I want to finish that last two feet because I want to say that I did that. And he said, all right. So I finished it. He said, thank you very much. And we went on with our lives. And about a year later, maybe 18 months later, it came down that the Vietnam War was kicking off and they needed some officers that were technically qualified in the photographic field. And that sergeant said, by that time I was a sergeant and that sergeant told the commander, well, he's too dumb to be a tech sergeant, so let's make him a second lieutenant. But first we got to cross train him into the combat camera field. So I was selected as one of four people that got training on cameras. So now I could do lab work and I could do cameras. And they gave me a very, very good education on how to operate and be a motion picture photographer. The four people were three still photographers that were cross-trained in and one lab rat. That was me. And so I did that. And then another year went by and they finally said, and in the meantime, they sent me to uh, a whole bunch of uh, contractors like Kodak and Technicolor and other places where I could learn more stuff about our craft. And so again, I got a great education. And about a year later, that same sergeant came and handed me some paperwork. And he says, it's time for you to apply for the Airman's Education and Commissioning Program. And to make a long story short, they sent me to the University of Southern California I got a degree in cinematography and studied under Stanley Kubrick and George Lucas and folks like that. And again, the universe blessed me richly. Right place, right time. And I asked the sergeant, why did you recommend, it, recommend me, Sarge? This was after I was commissioned and came back to Vandenberg for a visit. Happened to be on the IG team at the time. And he said, well, you weren't the smartest guy around. And you certainly weren't the most obedient, but you had perseverance. And no matter what job you had, no matter how menial it was, you did it. And that's why I recommended you. And that became a mantra for the rest of my life. And what you'll see coming up here has as much, oops, wrong button, has as much to do with perseverance as anything else. Uh, later, I became a combat cameraman. I spent the next 24, almost, yeah, 24 years literally traveling the world, uh, documenting significant events. Uh, as an officer now, I was shooting still and motion picture cameras. I was also functioning as a motion picture director and producer and documenting. If you look at the, some of the war correspondence on CNN right now, that's basically what I did uh, about 200 days a year. Uh, that was a very exciting job. I'd do it all over again, except for the part where my kids started calling me Uncle Daddy. Uh, so that's where I came from. And, and the important part of that is that during that time, it was drilled into me over and over and over again that you are a documentarian, you are capturing the world. You do not in any way alter what you have photographed. So well, there was no correction of anything. If, if, you, if you got a picture of, a, of, a, of an airplane on the runway and there was a tree in the way, you didn't Photoshop it out. Of course, there was no Photoshop there, but we had Oxbury printers so you could do that, but you didn't alter things. Altering a piece of film or editing it out of sequence or using multiple dated stuff would get you just your career destroyed. It would be over. Thank you. Listen up after me one more time. 
you know, you could be my wife. She's like that. <laughs> Okay, why tabletop? Again, the universe was very, very good to me. I had this documentary background. When I retired from the Air Force, quite literally, I didn't touch a camera for several years and was busy raising kids and getting a new job and all kinds of stuff like that. And then I came to Alaska and Chuck Moss introduced me to the Alaska Society of Outdoor Nature Photographers and digital photography and kind of shepherded me through that process. And I shall be forever grateful for that. So I started taking workshops and I started meeting people here. And again, I was being a wildlife photographer. And in those days, you submitted something to the stock agency. And again, you didn't alter anything. Uh, then something interesting happened. The Vietnam War caught up with me, and I had some health issues, particularly heart and lung problems that were the result of Agent Orange. So I went in and had open heart surgery on March the 19th. And on March 20th, the world was shut down for COVID. And I was, again, the universe blessed me, and I was one of the luckiest persons on the planet because I was the last guy that was allowed in the operating room. And the surgeon told me later, if luck you got in there, or you would have been in big trouble down the road. So here I am. That surgery turned out to be another one of those blessings in disguise because during my recovery, I was home. I was isolated because of COVID. And I was isolated, recovering from the heart surgery anyway. So what am I going to do? Well, I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it. And then I realized something had happened to me at Alaska Society of Outdoor Nature Photographers, in that I had met people like Julie Jessen, who did this thing called macro photography. Now, I'd never seen that before and made it look pretty, and I got inspired by it, so I started trying it. I wasn't very good at it, uh, but I liked doing it. And then along came a lady by the name of Nancy Rotenberg, who held a workshop on creative photography, and she literally changed not only the way I look at photography, but the way I look at the world. Her, her worldview opened my eyes to a whole different perspective that I had never seen before. And so that, for that, I too am extremely grateful. So that brings me to tabletop. Tabletop is something that I can do forever. And if I end up immobile, I can still do tabletop photography. If my stamina isn't quite what it used to be, I can still do tabletop, and it's a whole lot cheaper than a psychiatrist. Okay, what do you need? Equipment, image capture, how do you process it? How do you do those artistic embellishments? So let's get into that just a little bit. On the equipment side of the house, there's many approaches to it. These are the cameras that I use, the Canon 7D Mark II. I now have a Canon R6 mirrorless camera, which I love. And of course, I use my iPhone. And I find myself using the iPhone uh, more and more and more each day. And its capabilities are very, very impressive. And I'll try and point out some of those kinds of shots when we get to them. Lenses. I listed some lenses here. My primary macro lens now is the Canon 100 millimeter macro. Uh, I use a Lens Baby Composer Pro with a Sweet 35 and a Sweet 50. And basically, the Lens Baby is a special effects lens. Back in the motion picture days, we used to take a piece of optical glass and put it in front of the lens 
and smear Vaseline around the edges. And we called that the Doris Day effect because it gave kind of a soft glow to the image. Well, Lens Baby does that, but it gives you control and, it's, and, and it kind of gives you that ability to use sharpness and softness in the same frame creatively. Uh, a workhorse is the Canon EF24 to 105 zoom. It's just a really nice all-purpose lens. Uh, Canon extension tubes, and then the lens baby close-up filters. And that's kind of a collection of stuff. I keep pushing the wrong button. There is the close-up filters that fit on the lens baby. And all they do is allow you to move in closer and closer and closer uh, to get really magnified views. And then the extension tubes will fit on a number of the EF lenses and with the adapter on the RF lenses as well. And they work very well. And again, they let you focus much closer. I can put a 200 millimeter lens, standard 200 millimeter zoom lens, add the extension tubes, and focus down to a foot and a half. So I don't have that lens on here, but I, I often use telephoto lenses for macro work as well. Accessories. You cannot have enough clamps and clamps and devices to hold things. And whether you're holding a piece of fabric behind your subject, or you're holding the subject, or you're holding a light, uh, over the years, I have collected dozens of these. And I would guess that what you see in this image is probably about 20% of what I have. And I'm still getting more. indispensable equipment. One of those bottles is filled with water and the other bottle is filled with a mixture half and half of water and glycerin. And the only thing the glycerin does is makes bigger drops stick to the flowers and the grass and stuff. Lighting. This to me is probably the most important thing you have in your, is the lights. I use several. You'll notice there's a couple of fill lights there that are uh, probably two and a half by four, four and a half inches. See if I can do it. Yeah, that's these. This is a, a box light. It's actually an LED light, but it works like a box light. And that's about an eight and a half by 11 size. Multiple flashlights of varying uh, differences. And you notice that aluminum foil around there that's holding gels that are colored gels. And you notice now I am, I'm doing things that are, and by the way, these lights, I can change color intensity and adjust the amount of light that's coming out of them. And they work very well. I just got these two geodex uh, 80 watt adjustable lights with barn doors. And these come from my motion picture days. And what the barn doors do, and they are literally that, the barn doors here, they allow me to close off and focus the light on a particular area. And in this case, what I'm doing is lighting up the subject matter and keeping the light off that black background. Uh, and you have a lot of control with that, and you can get all kinds of different accessories to make little round things. And I make a lot of my own, just out of cardboard. Take a piece of cardboard, cut a hole in it, put it in front, and, uh, and clamp them onto that barn door, and then all of a sudden I have a very narrow beam of light lighting a very specific part of the, of the image. Uh, I normally use a two or three light setup, a... Key light, 
which is the main light, a, a fill light, which is a stop under the key light. And it's really easy to do that. I can either dial it on the back 50% versus 100%, or I can have them both at the same percentage, move it back. If this is two feet away, if that is four feet away, double the distance, I get one stop less light. It's just physics. And that works. And then you can end up with something like that. And by the way, I took that original image and the original image was tack sharp. And then I deliberately uh, put a, a softening filter over the top of it uh, to give it that effect, that kind of that kind of glow. Setup. This is kind of a fake setup. I doubt seriously that I would ever use all of this in one place. But here's some of the elements that are in the setup. I went down and got... Come on. Where's the button? There we go. I went down and got some art paper and a kid's set of watercolors and made a watercolor background. This is just garland and stuff, shiny stuff made out of reflective material. And by the way, when you put that behind a subject, it creates bokeh when it's out of, uh, out of focus and can add a lot. This is not my subject. This is the background to my subject. I've got a clamp that's holding a piece of grass here, and then I've got a piece of mylar, and the mylar can be used two ways. It can be used to, re to reflect light back to the underside of what you're photographing, or you can use it and actually include the reflection uh, in your photograph. And of course, there's that ever-present water bottle uh, uh, to add add drama to the to whatever you're photographing. In this particular case, there's the 100 millimeter macro lens. I've got a flashlight here. I've got one of the box lights here. And there's another light off frame down here picking up this side of it. So it's a three light setup. You'll notice the clamp is holding the piece of grass. And then I just decide, okay, what am I going to have in the background? Am I going to have the flower? Am I going to have the shiny stuff? Am I going to have the watercolor background? But my subject is going to be front and center, and everything in the background is going to be far enough away that with depth of field, it'll be blurry. And we'll see some of that. Now, here's the shot that I took, and this, this shot here is is one where I've photographed the subject matter and the bokeh. And the bokeh was created by that shiny material in the background because it's out of focus. And that was a piece of clear garland as opposed to the colored one. Next step is I went into Photoshop and used the uh, fill, uh, to eliminate the clamp, or you can eliminate with your composition and cropping, either way. And I started there. And then I got to playing with it in Topaz 2 uh, to add different colors, add different textures, and just mess around with it. And I did it again. There we go. Here again, this is a three layer of the same shot, shot, same piece of grass and a bokeh layer, a texture, four layers, a texture layer, and then the star effect, which came from uh, the, the Topaz library of stuff. This is just bokeh and texture, but you can see once you have the shot by layering it, with other textures, you can, you're only limited by your imagination. 
processing. I mentioned Topaz Studio 2. The ones I am using right now, my primary editing tool is Adobe Lightroom. And as Adobe Lightroom is, is morphing and changing, it is becoming more and more capable. I loved it several years ago, and now I love it even more. And it becomes more and more capable. Uh, and I find myself actually using it more now. It, I used to say I probably used Lightroom and, and Photoshop 80-20. And now it's probably 90-10, just because of Lightroom's capabilities for editing. And of course, the organizing, I really like Photoshop is Photoshop. It too is growing. I've uh, done a little bit of experimenting with some, their generative AI. Uh, that is weird stuff. We can, we can have a whole seminar on that. Uh, Topaz Studio 2 is one of my very favorite programs. The unfortunate part, is, if you got it, guard it, because Topaz is no longer going to support it. They're coming out with something called Photo AI, which will combine a lot of what's in Topaz Studio 2 for denoise work, sharpening work, and some other things they have coming down the road. But a lot of the special effects that they had, uh, right now I can still use them, but at some point uh, it'll just disappear because they're not supporting it anymore. And I do have the Nick collection, and I use the Nick collection fairly frequently to get some uh, color effects and processing effects and solarization effects and things like that that are in that program. But those are my favorites, and I'm always looking for something. In talking about the setup, here's an example of what I would call selective lighting. And the way I did this is I lit it so that it would and exposed it at a stop and a half underexposed. And then I had that uh, barn door light and I had a piece of cardboard with a toilet paper roll taped to it so that I could aim the light specifically at the flower. And then got the basic shot and then cleaned it up a little bit with the uh, filters in Lightroom. This is pretty much a straight shot, and here's where the barn doors came in handy, is that it allowed me to isolate. It's a piece of my wife's quilting fabric, some stuff I had laying around the house, but the black background stayed black, and I was able to control it by using the barn doors to keep the light off the background. I will say it wasn't perfectly black, so I used a, uh, a brush, and brushed in some underexposed area and brought it down to be a little bit blacker. This is a shot I took in the dining room cabinet. I like the bowl and I like the photographer, but obviously the clutter is, the, the background is cluttered. Now in the days before the modern filters, the only way you could get this shot was to very painstakingly paint in black that's one method, or you can go in and paint with three stops underexposed, and it takes that background and just underexposes it down to black, and then go in and, and do it again with a new brush and paint it again with three stops underexposed, and eventually you'll get black. And if you look carefully, I missed a spot right in there. But that's the old school. Now I can select background, turn it black, boom, two clicks, and it's done. The extension tubes that we were talking about or the close-up filters allow you to get in very, very close uh, and, and do selective focusing. Uh, this is kind of a combination of the extension filters and selective lighting. And then this is all lighting. It's a frozen flower. I froze uh, a, some flowers in distilled water 
and then lit it from the back and lit it from the front. So it's a three light setup and then zoomed in to find something interesting. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, this is processing in Photoshop. I have a lens ball and I discovered when I shoot with the lens ball and I'm close, I can focus on what the lens ball is seeing, which in this case is the flower, but then the lens ball itself goes soft. And I wanted both the flower that I'm seeing, and by the way, that is that flower in the background, but I also wanted to see the lens ball. So the only way I could do that was to do a stack focus where I took several images on a tripod in different focus points and then combine them in Photoshop and stack them so that everything I wanted to be in focus was is in focus. And it's just fun to play with that. And I should say play with that because that's where that word perseverance comes in. Because when I started doing this, I have thousands of photographs that are in the delete pile because they were terrible. And it took me a long time before I could get it to look the way I wanted it to look. So let's talk a little bit about textures. Uh, this is the, the shot of a flower and it's shot against a white background. I forget whether it's a piece of white fabric or whether it's against the light table, but it's just the shot of the flower. And that's what I wanted is I, I didn't want any background. But then I took it into Photoshop. And in this particular case, I layered it with two textures and blended them. And this is what you got. The, the black border is one texture. And then the, the, the gold and the blue is a separate texture. And those are, that's the three layer shot that that's just blended and using masks and, and a brush tool to erase the parts I wanted of the flower and emphasize the parts that I wanted of the textures. It's a fairly simple process. Once you learn how to do it once, you can apply it to all kinds of different things. Here's one of the textures. Here's a maple leaf, dried maple leaf uh, against the background. And then we add that texture and a colored texture and come up with this. There's another texture. And what, I, what I've done, and I'll go through these quickly, is every time I'm out on a photo shoot and I see something that I can take a picture of, that happens to be dew drops on a uh, spruce tree on the leaves. I take a picture of it and create a texture. That's, uh, let me go back here, one. That's ice cubes in a glass with a drop of red food coloring. That's Dawn dishwater soap in the sink. That is Boca. And when I was shooting some of that flower stuff, I just literally aimed it at the garland and threw it out of focus, got the Boca, and then started to play with it and shot several dozen shots. The nice thing about folk of uh, Photoshop is that you can, in the layers, that is one of those bokeh ovals that you saw in the previous shot. But once you get it into Photoshop and overlay it over your subject, you can, you can size it, you can transform it, you can distort it, you can do all kinds of things with it to, to make the effect that, you, that you're going for. And in this case, I used a texture that was a, leafy background. I think it's a piece of my wife's fabric. I used one of the bokehs 
and then I superimposed a flower in it. So it's a three layer, three layer shot. And you'll notice that mantra that I had is you alter nothing. Thanks to Nancy and the rest of the folks. Now I alter everything. Uh, those pure colors that I was trying to achieve back in the Vandenberg days, I don't care anymore. I want the color to look the way I want it to look. And if it's, if the blue is too blue, then I can make it green. I can make it red. I can make it whatever color I want. And therein lies the art of it, from, from at least from my point of view. So those color numbers that are in the that you read that that I used to be so worried about, I don't I don't even know quite for sure where they are anymore, in in the screen. And that brings us to those artistic embellishments. Uh, this was a very straightforward lens baby, or not lens baby, lens ball shot. And by the way, when you use a lens ball, number one, you have to support it somehow. So there's usually a stand or something holding the lens ball. And secondly, like all lenses, it turns everything in the lens ball upside down. So you have to first turn it upside right and then use the clone tool to eliminate the stand uh, to create the lens ball effect. And in this case, you'll notice the, see if I can do this again, right? This background here was cluttered with stuff on the wall. So I used the clone tool again to create a more neutral background and that flowers and vase are sitting on a table. And then I took it into Topaz Stu Studio 2, and I added this texture, which is one of the effects that was in Topaz, and then created a mask, which was built into Topaz, and erased the texture in places that I didn't want it, and kept it where I did want it, and then, adjusted the opacity of the texture to suit the mood I was in at the moment. And that's the finished result. So it that is an image that I used Lightroom, I used Photoshop, I used Nick, and I used Topaz in this same image. Here again, a lens ball image. And I just went for broke and used the texture and left it on everything. This is a lens baby shot. And as I said before, the lens baby uh, designs to give you a controllable soft focus. So the lens baby allowed me to focus on the flower and basically the center of it. And then as you progress, my focus point is here. And then as you progress away from that center, it gets softer and softer and softer and softer until you get that effect. So most of that effect was created by the, the lens itself. And I just added a little bit of color texture to it to embellish it as to make it something beautiful, at least in my mind. I'll let you, you guys decide whether that was successful or not. And here too, this was one where I took it into Topaz. I put a texture over the top of it and the texture covered the whole thing. And, and you can see the texture up in the corner and on the sides. And then I use the mask. You click on the mask, you take the brush and you erase it off your central subject. And I just erased it off the, the bouquet of flowers. Again, here's that selective lighting that you saw earlier, but then combine that with a texture layer. And the texture layer is the yellow background. And then I erased it off the vase and the flowers. Same, same process here. It's one of my favorite processes. Same thing here. That's a lens baby shot. And the, the softness of the vase comes from the lens, the sharpness of the flower is my focal point. 
And by the way, in order to get that, uh, you're shooting pretty wide and then cropping down to the shape you want. Uh, combination thing, that topaz texture, and then a normal shot, just at the 24, 105 millimeter lens shot of the vase. And by the way, that was my mother's talent. She hand painted uh, with a technique called China painting. And she didn't do that from a pattern. She did that from scratch. Just blending of colors, layer after layer, firing after firing. Uh, I think she told me there were 13 firings to make that vase. And she was very, very good at it. This is just a simple, I took the picture of the flower in the vase, had a texture, I turned the texture back black and white, and then left the flower in two separate layers, and that was the effect. Simple two texture, one texture blended, Probably you did that with a, with soft light blending mode. Those blending modes in, in Photoshop, by the way, are extremely powerful. And there again, uh, it's perseverance and experimentation. You use one and you look at it and it looks crappy, but then you start moving the sliders on opacity and stuff. And then all of a sudden you begin to find stuff that you like. This is a peacock feather. Uh, and I... Uh, abstracted it with a filter and abstracted the whole thing and then erased the effect out of the center portion of the peacock feather to bring back uh, probably 20% of the texture is still there and all of it is there on the on the upper parts of it. And, I, and, and in using textures, that's one of the things that I learned is I rarely ever use them at full strength. Uh, I often bring them down to sometimes as low as 10% of the ten texture in the opacity, and rarely do I use it at 100%. That's just taking, it was a, a standard shot. I shot it up at the Otter Lake on J-Bear standard color shot of a uh, wild rose, and then just turned it into a black and white, and then use the texturing tool to turn it into a line drawing, which is a filter effect. Something else I enjoy, and I think this was inspired by my good friend over here, Amber. Uh, I saw her do some of the light box photography and said to myself, self, you have to learn how to do that. So my wife has a light box that she uses to trace quilt patterns. And so I borrowed it and then started photographing stuff on it. And, and the, the effect it gives you is the only light on it is the light coming from behind the light box. And so you get a translucent effect. And if you like, you can take another light and illuminate the face of whatever you've got on there so that you get some of the detail of whatever it is you're photographing. And kind of, you can kind of juggle with that till you get what you want and juggle with the exposures. If you expose for the object on the light table, the light behind it goes kind of yellow beige because you're underexposing it. If you expose so that the table is really white, then you get more of the translucent effect. And the, finding that right exposure for what the effect you want is, is the experimentation. So here's one. This one I exposed literally for the flower. And you'll notice the background is slightly yellow, but it's the same light box that I took those other leaves on. But then I just reversed that and made the background black with a full layer of black and erased it out of the, erased the leaf out of the black background, two layers. Here's three textures, same leaf, 
uh, tech textured. Uh, yeah, there's two textures behind it. So it's a three layered shot. Here's that same bunch of leaves with a single texture and two two layers, one texture uh, on the on the background and then erased that texture off the leaves. Or you can just have fun and zoom in. And then the translucent effect is really cool. Here is taking it another step. Uh, the flower was shot with the lens baby against the light table. And then two textures there. But then instead of erasing the whole flower, the center of the flower there, if I can find this button again, the center of the flower, I erased the texture 100%. And then as I moved out to the edges, I reduced it very slowly from 100 to 70% to 20% to 10% to 5%. And then you end up with that. That's just me fooling around trying to find a forest nymph. I just thought it was cute. Okay, using water drops as a lens. Kathy, you're going to have to help me with the pronunciation of come workshop ASONP come up. Don. Uh, what was his, how do you pronounce his last name? Kamaracha? Don Kamaracha. Yes, that's it. Uh, did a, uh, a workshop with ASONP on this process of macro. And basically, this is the setup. Uh, you take a flower and you put it in a clamp uh, anywhere from three to six inches away from your subject, which is also in a clamp. And then you light, not the subject, but you light the background. And there's enough spill off over the subject that you can, you can get a good image. He had the ability to hand hold a macro lens. As you can see, I do not have that ability. I have the right, but I do not have the ability to handhold. So I use a tripod. What that allows you to do is do stuff like this. This is a piece of grass. That is that flower, the yellow center of the flower. The petals are the purple and sprayed the grass liberally with distilled water. Uh, no, it was regular tap water and then you get some weird effects. And those water drops act as lenses. And you'll see that more clearly as we go on. What uh, light were you using? A flashlight. What? Uh, a, a Costco $20 flashlight held in a clamp, aimed at the flower behind, and then there was some spillover so that's why you you see the flower reflected in the water drops so clearly is because it's what is illuminated. And the grass and the water droplets are actually a bit underexposed if you really examine it closely. And of course, this happens to be a lot of, a lot of uh, spikes on the grass. And so you get a lot of dro water drops. And you can just you could just play with each one of those water drops has has that flower in it as focus with the lens. And there's uh, one of the things that he did is you can kind of try and focus on an overall focus, or you frequently do stack focus, and that's why the tripod is so important to me is that piece of grass is three-dimensional. 
So you sh there's this shot is probably the same shot locked down, but focused at maybe three or four or as much as five different places so that more and more of those drops are in focus. And focus stacking, I think Ray Bolson did a workshop on focus stacking, which is, a, is an art all by itself. But Photoshop makes it real easy now. Uh, if you add a little glycerin to the stray bottle, it'll make a big drop and you can do stuff like that. And this is a flower petal in the foreground and the flower in the background. And then very carefully with a syringe, put three drops of water on the petal. And by the way, some petals work because they got little fuzz on them that'll hold the water. And some of them, it just runs out and you just got to play with that. And you get the three drops and then it focuses on the back. And then me being me, I added a little piece of bokeh in the top just to give it give the the uh, give it a little balance on the composition same shot just handled with different textures or similar shot it was the same setup this is a straight shot it's a dandelion uh plain old dandelion that has gone to seed and I sprayed it with a spray bottle and uh, took the shot. Uh, it's, it's probably cropped down to about a third of the frame because it's the interesting part. Uh, and by the way, if you're going to do this, get a lot of those dandelion frost because as soon as you spray them, uh, they fall apart pretty quickly. Oh, and have sponges and towels. Uh, you can make a mess. Fortunately, my wife was at the quilt group, so I got to clean it up before she got home so I didn't get in trouble. Here again is, uh, uh, this is a, another dandelion and more of the, more of the seeds had blown away. Uh, and so the water droplets, when I sprayed it, uh, stayed more. I put a texture behind it, but I don't think it was it was pretty without it. The only texture is the border around the top. The basic yellow behind it is the flower. This one is pretty heavily textured. It's a piece of string. Sprayed it with water, photographed it, and then colorized it. Mylar and mirrors shooting reflections. You could have a lot of fun with this. And this is the basic setup. I've got actually three lights here. This is a the small box light, uh, rechargeable, aimed at the flowers. I've got a larger box light aimed at the watercolor background. And then I've got a fill light that is off camera, uh, probably two or three times the distance away from the flowers on a separate table. And that is a piece of mylar that I bought at uh, uh, the craft store up on, on Diamond. Uh, and you'll notice the flowers are reflected in the mylar and the background is reflected in the mylar, but the mylar is not like a mirror. It's a soft reflection. And if you go online and look for mylar, there are mylar, there's mylar that you can buy that are highly reflective and moderately reflected and soft reflected. This happens to be uh, one that is, is soft uh, and there are also mylars that you can cr crinkle up. They're like uh, aluminum foil. And I've used aluminum foil as a reflector too. That works really well. You crinkle it up and then you smooth it out and it gives all kinds of, of a wavy look. That's really cool. Uh, 
and then you can you can set it up like that. Uh, that's just a piece of a white poster board on the left, and that water watercolor texture that I made uh, on the right. And there is the finished product with selective focus. I probably shot this at two eight, which threw the watercolor out of focus. The mylar was out of focus, but the reflection of the flower was close enough to the flower that it stayed more in focus with the depth of field. And you got a very nice, very nice look. Now, I will admit that as you come across, as you come across here, the demarcation line through this area was visible. So I took the clone tool in Photoshop and blended that in so that that was seamless. There was not a seam there. Variation on a theme. Here, here again, uh, the mylar and white poster board. And you'll notice the background, that gap, I could not get that reflection right. So the only thing I could do is take the shot and use the shot, but then I put a texture behind it. And then with colorization, I eliminated that background. And that's just using the clone tool to brush and paint and brush and paint and brush and paint until you got it like it was sitting in a corner. And Here's a straight shot, and in this case, I thought the that demarcation line uh, was kind of added to it, and that is aluminum foil, the shiny side of aluminum foil, and I crumpled it up and then smoothed it out, and then that texture in the foreground there is aluminum foil. And again, it's just, you know, sitting there thinking, what have I got in the house, and what can I do with it, and how's it going to work? Same idea there. Doesn't have to be a flower. Could be anything. Decided one day, okay, I like the mirrors. I keep trying really, really hard to get them out of the frame. So why not include it in the frame? That's about a 15 inch in diameter mirror. And all I did is take, took the shot and then added a layer of texture behind it and erased most of it out of the flower in the middle. That's a mistake. I wanted to shoot that at f2.8, and I probably shot it at f8, and that's why the background is still in focus. That's before I cropped it. You can see the part of the light is in the left-hand corner, but, uh, you know, it's... Like I say, it's experimentation and you get a lot of failures before you get stuff you like. But I thought I'd include it anyway. I like that better. And this is one of my favorites. It's got the mylar. There's no line of demarcation. The stem is very soft and the texture is very subtle. And by the way, uh, I softened with clarity, with the clarity in a brush, softened the edges of the of the flower. I could have done that with a lens baby and got a similar effect. In this case, I shot it with a 24 105 lens and then used the clarity tool to soften the, the edges of the flower. That that is a lens baby shot there. You'll notice the reflection is very soft and the flower is very sharp. Nice thing about the lens baby is that it tilts so you can put the focus point, your point of critical focus anywhere in the frame you want. You can raise it up, raise it down, put it left, put it right. Uh, you can do all kinds of stuff. Another thing I like having fun with is frozen flowers. And I show this slide first because underneath that fabric is about six towels. 
and we're talking frozen flowers, which means the flowers are frozen in ice and the ice is melting. And that's a good thing, but it's also a messy thing. Uh, there is a lighting system there where this is the wide box light. There's a narrow box light there. Behind this box light over here in the corner, you can basically see the stand. There's a flashlight coming this way to mount the edges. There's a flashlight over here coming from the edge. There's a flashlight up on the stand that's supporting the cloth pointing down. And then when I'm getting ready to shoot, there will be a light behind the ice here. So there's one, two, three, four, five. That is a six light setup. Mo Devlin uses flashes to do that. And they all, he positions them and they all go. Uh, I've never figured out how to do that and I don't own enough flashes. So I do it with flash lights. Uh, and I don't know which is better. This is the basic setup. Uh, what I did there is I took two flowers and I put them in a shallow corningware bowl. And by the way, the, fl the flowers were will float, so you have to find a way to hold them down. So basically the way I learned to do that is you take two chopsticks or two sticks with rubber bands on them and you grab the stem with the two sticks like that and place it so that you can put the flower in and hold it down to the bottom of the dish. The other thing you have to do is use distilled water. If you use regular tap water, the impurities in the water will not give you the effect that we'll see here. They'll just give you a white blob of frozen material and it's very unattractive. So distilled water is very, 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 very important critical to the process. It's the only thing that'll work. And here again, you can see that lighting system. There's one, two, three, four lights visible. Uh, and there is a light. It's kind of buried under the fabric there behind the seashell. And then you get stuff like this. There's the stand that's supporting the ice. And I have a chopstick a uh, rubber band to the stand to hold the back of it. And you can see, if you look closely, that's the chopstick. Uh, and that's the frozen flower. And I did that. I didn't have to weight that one down because I used a freezer bag and I put the flowers in the freezer bag and filled it with water, laid it flat in the freezer overnight and got that. And what, what makes frozen flowers work is that when it freezes, the flowers are giving, as they get cold, they're giving off oxygen and carbon dioxide. And those bubbles are moving slowly and they create those lines and bubbles and things that make them interesting. And when I said you have to use distilled water, there's some impurity. And that probably came off the flower that was dirty and it created some impurity. So that's where the bubbles didn't form. That's another one, another look. Again, just playing with it. The real fun with frozen flowers, though, is to put the extension tubes on and get close and start looking for interesting things, interesting patterns within that, that frame. This one is I found that interesting pattern and it was nice all by itself, but then I, I did a composite and added a flower to it. This is an extreme close-up, and I believe this is a photo stack. I could make one where I, 
I could get this in focus, or I could get this in focus, or I could get this in focus because it's a three-dimensional object, but I couldn't get them all. So I basically zoomed in, took three shots, focused at different points, stacked them, and then came up with the frozen flower. Similar process here. These are the bubbles that are coming toward me. I just like the color and the line. This is the this is where Nancy Rotenberg came in and she says, Ken, you're not photographing flowers. You're photographing line and form and color. And I think that when I had it in the freezer, my, my wife must have got the chicken out and it changed the angle so the bubbles went in a different direction. This one was more bubbles and less lines. Again, you find different things in different places on the flower. And if you have those extension tubes or close-up filters, you can really get in close and capture that. And that's where it gets interesting. This is a stack focus. There's probably four inches. And that there is an actual crack in the ice. The other thing I found is when I start out and place it on the holder, I'll get a whole series of images. But then as the ice melts, it reveals more of what's under there and you get to see more and more and more as the ice melts. And Mo Devlin says he'll, he will take and take an ice block and he'll photograph it, make several images and take it under the sink and run water over it and speed up the melting process and put it back and take some more and it'll be totally different images. Yes. Uh, and I haven't broken the code on that as to which ones. I wish I had wrote it, written it down so I had a list. But some flowers do a lot of that, and they show up really, really nice. And some flowers don't do anything. They just kind of sit there and go best. Uh, uh, some of the... And by the way, uh, on a lot of these, if the flower is fairly thin like a daisy and you've got a powerful light behind it, you'll get a translucent effect like a light table. But some flowers that are thicker like roses, you have to light the front of the flower too. And then the angle of the light becomes important because you start getting reflections on the ice of the lights. And sometimes if it's minor, you can just clone them out. But sometimes... You, you just kind of got to work around them and either crop them out or uh, or get them out and, or move the light or get the reflection to be someplace else on the on the frozen flower. Here's one where I just took a uh, a standard shot and combined it. I thought, well, combine it and give it a kind of a sunflower and a storm effect. Okay, that's kind of the, here's what we did. And then I'll just run through these uh, quickly. Just the gallery of stuff that I've done over time. This is an iPhone shot, shot at Fred Myers with an iPhone and then textured in Topaz. Lens baby. Uh, this is a dogwood shot down at uh, Peterson Lake on the Kenai Peninsula and then textured. Lens baby. Just a close up of a leaf with a texture. This is a technique called light painting. And what I did here is had the lights on, 
set up the camera on a tripod, focused the camera, had the complete setup with a remote camera release, had the exposure set for 10 seconds, and then turned all the lights off, and then used a flashlight and just painted the flower in the vase. And again, 20 shots later, I got one I liked. But you begin to, as you do them, you begin to say, oh, I left it on too long. I didn't leave it on long enough. Oh, I got too much there. I got too little there. Uh, but light painting is, is kind of fun all by itself. And simple compositions work better than complex compositions when you're light painting. That's light painting. The other one was exposure. This one is light painting. Uh, that is just a close-up lens with a texture in the background erased off the foreground. Doesn't all have to be macro. You can you can do still lives and get some interesting and exciting uh, things there. There's nothing, nothing fancy there. I think I put just put a lot of light on there and the candle spikes come from a, oh, it's at least F16. Lens baby. Christmas, Christmas card, exactly. That's what it was, is. I just like the contrast on this one, the, the bright oranges and the dark background. That is a plastic ball that I got from Pier 1 when it still existed. And I just photographed it against a red cloth and added a little texture to the to the ball itself. Most of that is in the plastic. That uh, peacock feather that I abstracted before, this is the feather shot naturally. It's just depth of field. That's the only thing that's there. That's just a flower shot against a cloth background and the background is thrown out of focus because of depth of field. And then I softened it a bit uh, in with clarity. Another light painting shot. I would say that that is a little, I overpainted it with a little bit too much light. My wife says it's perfect. So she's right, of course. Light painting. Just close up of water on a leaf. Layered textures. Straight shot. Straight shot. No texture, no nothing, just a straight shot. Taking advantage of the reflection. There's a flower behind it. So I took advantage of that. Glycerin, yes. Again, a tabletop, straightforward tabletop, no textures. That's just uh, fabric. The, the lucky thing that I have is that my wife is a, is a obsessive, no, master quilter. She has a fabric stash that is out of this world and so all I have to do is rummage through it to find backgrounds, and it's really cool. That's before cropping. Lens baby. Straight shot there. Light painting. Lens ball without the photo stacking, but textured. 
on the edges. A mylar shot. That's just colorizing. Straight shot there. That's lens, <clears throat> excuse me, that's lens baby. I particularly like this shot because my whole life I have tried to get everything tack sharp. And then I find one of the most, my favorite shots was deliberately soft focus. That was inspired by Pixar's logo. How close can I get and still make it recognizable? And the line. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's why you use resource protectors. Uh, everything. Uh, some of them are pieces of paper that I scribble on. Uh, I, as I'm wandering around, no matter what I'm shooting, uh, I will see something that has texture in it. Oh, that table has got a nice texture on it. Take a picture of just that uh, and include it in the, and then I got a, a file in, in Lightroom that it is just textures. And uh, yeah, quite frankly, if Topaz goes out of business, I won't be able to use their textures anymore. So I better create my own. And so that's what I'm doing. And it's just a matter of looking for them uh the 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 pattern in a in a shirt uh some water drops on a leaf uh, uh a cottonwood leaf that's frozen and it's starting to decay anything anything and everything that gives you an interesting look and then the nice part about it is when you take it into photograph into photoshop you can enlarge it and just use a tiny little piece of it you can contract it you can select a circle of it and put it in a corner and blend it and put uh, water drops in this corner and put an out of focus flower in this corner and blur them out to a point where all they look like is texture. Uh, so there's, there's anything and everything everywhere. I got one that's dead fish, salmon in the stream. I'm sure some of you have seen dead fish, so. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, the craft store, what is it? Uh, Michael's up on Diamond Boulevard. See, I couldn't be president because I couldn't remember the name of Michael's. Uh, the craft store up on Michael uh, Michael's on Diamond. Uh, they have all kinds of uh, uh, mylar, it's supposed to be wrapping paper, party paper, but one of them that was a reflective uh, silver and a reflective gold. And so I got that. And online, those quite frankly, aren't very good because they're very stiff. Online, if you, if you look up mylar, there are all kinds of mylars with different crinkly effects party tied up their party stuff the stuff that uh, the party balloons are made out of you can buy that kind of mylar and you can stretch it and make lines in it and stuff like that you can get you know you could supply the whole club for 20 bucks on a big roll yeah you can you you if you look through amazon and look through the various places you can find it I just haven't ordered it. I've, I've been kind of using the Michael stuff and aluminum foil and a, and a mirror mirror, a regular mirror. 
Any other questions? That was very fascinating. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That was great, Danny. Okay, so. Yeah, you got it. Let's take about a 10 minute break and then um, we do have member slides and we have our drawing. So if people just need a five minute break and we can go straight into that and we actually might do that in a couple of this is for an REI gift certificate. Is that right? Yeah. REI gift certificate. We got an extra uh, semi gloss, which would probably be the last thing to go. <laughs> we had a Stewart's $25 gift certificate. Gift certificate. Sorry, 25 bucks. I didn't get a graphic ticket. All right. Everybody got a ticket. Everybody ready? Got your ticket out? Got your ticket out. Going First on. one is 435, last three numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, you can still sign up to help with the last. I want that paper, right? <laughs> <laughs> for help. Maybe you draw a number. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there we go. I like that, Julie. That's perfect. The next table is four thirty. Woohoo! I bet you we didn't take this. Four thirty tonight. Chair for Alaska Wild. <laughs> Okay. And 427. Lucky 427. Ellen, get some paper. Huh? No. Oh, I thought you were 427. No, 427. Going once. Going twice. Nobody wants to claim it. <laughs> 416. 416. Amber, do you want it? Was that Chad? Where's Chad? I think it was. Oh, okay. I thought you had the exact numbers, actually. She does math. Okay. More time. One more time. Four oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah, so, let's go. 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 let us go 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 let
So I went from the most environmentally polluted town in the world to the most alcohol polluted town in the known universe. And uh, it was crazy. A summons will be issued to Tom Alana to answer for charges of criminal mischief. Investigation by the Moan Police Department revealed that Alana defecated on a pool table at the Board of Trade Saloon. Now, where else in the known universe would you be able to watch someone crapping on a pool table? Of course, Gnome. Where else? Oh, I haven't. Okay, I saw people who said you raised your hand. You've been a Gnome. Which one? How do you, any of you know what sidewalk pizza is? I learned sidewalk pizza when I got there. It's vomit on the street. And in 1970 to 1971, the winter, that's when I was there, uh, the, the, the bars were open 24-7. Yes, they never closed. The following year, the summer of 71, they closed them for about two hours, as, as I remember. So it was kind of neat looking at sidewalk pizza, you know. Uh, we just heard from Ken. And there were some very creative uh, artistic uh, sidewalk pizzas uh, that, that you could observe. Okay, here it is, 2012, the second coldest winter on record in Nome. And you look down there, the all time record, the winter of 1970 to 71. And that's where I was. So last month we had cold weather photography. And as soon as I heard that subject, here it is. You're going to see the coldest weather photography. That, that's the whole winter. That's the, that's the average. And I have in my pocket, Kathy, thank you for noting that. The all-time lowest record in Alaska occurred 21 January 1971. Where was it? Prospect Creek, which is north of, of uh, Square Banks, and uh, the coldest temperature recorded in Nome was 27 February, here again, 1971, minus 40 below zero. So here, here are the facts. Okay, there's, there's uh, Main Street Nome. And also in uh, October 1970, I got there in, in the summer, what happened for the very first time in Nome, and I got a funny, plenty of pictures of them, it had asphalt laid on the road. And I, get, uh, I have two really uh, big programs. I have a 140-slide a program on Nome and a 140-slide program out in the villages. In uh, half my time in Nome in the winter, I spent uh, working in all the Northwest villages from uh, Norvik, Kotzebue, Shishmaref, Wales, Savunga, Teller, Breving Mission, Unalakleek, St. Michael, and Stebbins. And uh, that Nikramat. Nikon never failed me once. It worked perfectly. I didn't have to worry about a battery. And I took pictures in 40, 45 below zero, which you'll be seeing. Okay, here's a, a typical day in Nome. Get through these. You got to be careful how you string up your, your dogs. You don't want them, you know, eating each other. Oh, that's um, usually. Uh, Noam always looks forward to the Coast Guard bringing in their drunken sailors each winter, except for this winter. That's as close as the cutter could get to Nome, and none of the drunken sailors were able to make it into town, which uh, town took a big hit on that. Right, here I am up in Kotzebue, minus 45 below zero. And I still remember my eyelids freezing shut. 
it was scary. Oh, here I am out in Savunga. I was very privileged. The local gang uh, let me get down into their hideout. And this is my favorite shot in Nordic. Here again, it's 40 below zero. I mean, if I, if I was a criminal, this is where I want to be. I have my own private jail. I mean, how can you beat that? Really fantastic. Okay. Next. Is that it? Wow. Is that somebody else's picture? Yes. You want me to run it? Okay. Talk about this one. Okay. Wow. Next. Where was this, Larry? Okay. Oh, cool. I'm not is that it? Okay. Yes, you can still sign up to help us with a lot of wild. And uh I know you can do a very good job, obviously. And it was everything fine to get to be your chairs back the way they were. I'll just 